I get people tell me all the time, they're like, man, Jason, I don't know what it is, but the band at your church is insane. Huh? Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, they are they are so passionate about worship and 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 and, and getting us to the throne. It's like if you came here this morning, like I don't know if I can sing. You're behind. We'll get drugs to the throne room, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Man, it's insane. Um, gosh, you know, it's it's. I, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, absolutely incredible. I love coming to this place, and I love to worship with you guys, and I love to be able to, to, to be a part of that. Um, talking about worship, we're talking about our values and, and, and about worship, and we're talking about worship really all day today, and um, and, and, and really, I'm hoping I'll give you some stuff to think about. Let me let me just give you this. About a couple years ago, I was studying angels and, and, and uh, this idea of who they were. We know that there's three angels that are actually listed by name. In the Bible, okay. So the first one you know of, his name is Gabriel. He's the one that came with the message from the from the Lord to Mary, right? We just talked about this on on uh, on Christmas, and so we know his name is Gabriel. We know that he shows up and he gives God's messages or God's word. He's like a deliverer of the word, so he, he's a very important person in this uh, uh, um, angel uh, hierarchy. The other one is Michael. Is listed. He's an archangel. He he's the one that wrestles. He's the one that that seems to be covers prayer when you pray and 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 you you go to God and you're you're seeking His face and and Michael the archangel seems to be the one that's kind of responsible for the prayers being answered and and his responsibility. That so when people pray like Daniel, you see Michael showing up, right, and uh, and, and, and and delivering messages from the Lord. And so you have the word, and, and you have prayer, and, and you have this thing called worship. Now, the one angel that's listed that was in charge of worship, his name was Lucifer. And we see this in the Old Testament. And his job, his responsibility was, he was the one leading all of heaven, as we understand in the Old Testament, all of heaven in, in worship and in song. The Bible talks about how Lucifer, his body was musical instruments. And that he was covered in the most beautiful thing that God created of all the angels. And God's glory would shine on him. And then through him, all of God's glory would be, you know, shine, shine out throughout all of eternity in and, 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 and the throne room of heaven. It was God's glory going through him. And then Lucifer says, I want to be like God. I'm going to be like the Most High. And then God found pride in his heart, threw him out of heaven, changed his name from Lucifer to what? Satan. You ever wondered why Satan hates church? You ever wonder why God, Satan really hates you? Let me tell you why he really hates you. Because you're doing your job. The church's responsibility now is to worship the Lord. So when he was kicked out of heaven... He said to God, oh yeah, who's going to take my spot? Oh, you're getting this, aren't you? <laughs> oh, oh, you, oh you, you, look how beautiful I am. You, you think you got something that's beautiful like this? And God says, I have something better. My children will lead themselves and worship to me. Our job is not led by an angel or an archangel. Our job is to worship God. He hates you because you get to do his job. The thing that he stole the glory from, the thing that he thought it was him, here we are. And when we do it, we do it with such hopelessness in a sense because we're not there we're not these beautiful creatures there's nothing dynamic about us we're just human beings right we're flawed we're we were met we came here this morning we got problems we got issues right but we got 99 problems but what worship ain't one right come on now go <laughs> so jay-z in the house right 
my little Jesus up in there, Jay-Z. So what I'm saying to you is, is that we have all these issues, but worship cannot be the one. It can't be the one. And Satan hates you. Listen to me. He hates you. He hates you. You have to know this. He doesn't like you. He wants to murder you. Why is my life so hard? Satan. I hear people say all the time, well, why would God take my loved ones? Why would God allow this stuff to happen? Let me tell you something. God does not allow people to die. That was never his plan. His plan when he created Adam and Eve in a perfect world, perfect <coughs> garden, listen to me, was to live forever with him. You know who jacked it up? You did. I did. And God says, now i got to fix it. And the only way for me to fix it is to send my son to die on the cross for your sin. Cover your sin so that you can be with me forever. So we have to live in this little world for however many years. But, but listen, but this isn't it. This is not what it's all about. We're just like trying to survive right now. Because this is not our home. Right? We're passing through. Let me just give you this. So what is worship? Worship, listen, this is the definition. It's probably not even the best definition, but I like it because uh, I wrote most of it. Uh, it's a human response to the perceived presence of the divine presence which transcends normal human activity and is holy. Worship is all about, listen, your reaction to a holy and righteous God. What is worship? Is worship music? It's more than music. Actually, worship is what you do with the music. Worship is when you hear the words and you say, these chains are falling. Are they really falling? Some of us are going, I want to hold these chains. And some of us are going, get off me. Worship is when you say, get off me. So why is worship so important to God? Because it's the synergy by which we order and sustain our spiritual connection to him. So here's the question. What kind of church are we? Ah, what a question. Jason, but what kind of church is renewal? How would you describe your church? Uh, homeless right now? <laughs> <laughs> Getting ready to build? Getting ready to break ground? We got a future? We know we're not staying here. Matter of fact, when we even build, we know we're not going to stay there. What are we? Let me tell you what I feel that I think we should all together say we are. When people say to you, what kind of church is your church? Here's what I want you to say. We are a presence-driven church. But what does that mean? That means my pastor doesn't care about anything else other than bringing God into the center of everything. Amen. That's all we care about. So my life is falling apart. Okay, let's bring God into the center of it. Right. My marriage is falling apart. Let's bring God into the center of it. My kids are crazy. Let's kick them out of the house and bring God into the center of it. <laughs> right? My parents are losing it. Let's just, you know, move them out. Let's all get Listen, we, we have issues. But when we bring God into the center of everything, somehow everything just seems to be ordered and, and followed, like, almost like in rank. They fall in line. If, you're, if your world is feeling chaotic, let, let's, what's at the center of it? You have to determine that. I cannot determine this for you. Let me give you the text. We have two texts. One text you have. Another text you don't have because I just threw it in at the last minute. I wanted to share it with you. So here we are, Genesis 28. You have your Bible, Genesis 28, verse number 10. Let me read the text to you again. We talked about it last week. We're going to be on this for a couple weeks. So don't be surprised. Don't think Jason doesn't have how I, I don't think you studied this week. I think you know it's the same text. So last, you know, but this, this, we're going to be here. here. So here it is. Verse 10. Meanwhile, Jacob left Be'er, Beersheba and he traveled to Haran. Remember I told you uh, last week, Jacob uh, was, was in a sense moved out of his household. He he, he basically conned his brother and, and, and got the birthright. And, and so, and, and I read this commentary, I thought it was kind of crazy. So the mom recognized the sibling rivalry, and she's like, we got to do something about this. Somebody said for her to keep her son, she had to lose her son. Right? Jesus 
said for you to have your life, you must die with Rufus, right? Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba, so he's going to follow his dad's commands. We'll talk about that in a minute. Left Beersheba, he traveled toward Haran, and at sundown he arrived at a good place to set up camp, and he stopped there for the night. Jacob found the stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth, that reached from earth up to heaven. So there was a point where he, at the place where he is, he looks up, he sees the stairway. You know what church is? Church is basically that place where the stairway happens. It's where God connects with his people. Hopefully today you came to church going, I really want to hear from God today. Hopefully you said, man, I just, I just, Jason, you're a nice guy. Uh, you, you know, you make some funny jokes, but, but we want to hear from Jesus. Man, the band sounds great, but I need to hear songs that just rock my world right now. I need songs that really kind of bring it back into where I need to be, right? Kind of zero it back in. So it says this. He goes, as he slept, he drank of a stairway to reach down from, uh, from, the, from earth up to heaven. He saw angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. He said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants, and your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, from the, from the, east, from the west to the east, to the north and the south, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your, uh, through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you. And I will protect you wherever you go. And one day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything I have promised you. Let me ask you a quick question. Did, did Jacob remind himself of the promise and go to bed? No, he just went to sleep. And God said, let me tell you about a promise I made. And Jacob awoken from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said that what an awesome place this is, that none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. The next morning, Jacob got up very early and took the stone there. He rested his head up against and he set it in this place, Bethel. He poured oil over it, set his place, made a memorial pillar, he poured oil over it, and he named that place Bethel, which means the house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on my journey, or on this journey, and if he will provide for me food and clothing, and if he would turn me safe to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up to become a place of worship, a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything that he gives me. I will tithe back and give him back everything. Let me give you the, the, the text real quick in verse 1 and 2 of the same chapter, so you should be in 28. Just go up to verses 1 and 2 as we're setting it up. Here's the obedience of worship. So Isaac called for Jacob to bless him, and he said, this is before the journey. You must not marry any of these Canaanite women. Instead, go at once to Padam Adram, the house of your grandfather Bethuel, and marry one of your uncle Laban's daughters. So there are there is the instructions that he is to not marry the women in the area, but to go back and marry one in the family. And we talked about this last week how it was not about keeping uh, everything in the family; it was about keeping worship in the family. He said, "Don't marry a Canaanite woman." Talk a little bit more about that. So let me just real quickly give you the points that I kind of touched on last week, but didn't really get to spend a whole lot of time on. So here we are. The first one talked about is the anatomy of pure worship. The first point is this: there was a calling before there was a blessing. There was a calling given before there was a blessing given. God calls us. We talked about this last week. You don't find God. God calls your name. You ever, you ever been in a situation where you're driving in your car, or maybe you're sitting in your house, and you and God says something to you, like you feel prompted to do something. God's speaking to you. God says, call this person. God says, pray for this person. God says, spend time with me. God says, worship me now. You know, whatever it is, he, he call, he's calling us. He prompts us. So the father called the son. The son didn't just show up in the dad's, you know, uh, hey, what's up, pops? No. He said, son, come to me. Let me just give you a verse real quick. John 6, 44 says, No one can come to me, this is Jesus talking, unless the Father who has sent me draws them to me. And at the last day I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will, they will, 
uh, all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. You never find God, he always finds you. Mark 2.17 says it this way. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Right? You say it this way. Um, that's why Jesus says it this way. He says that, that it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. I've heard, I've heard commentators talk about, well, he's not literally talking about a camel and an eye. He is literally talking about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to go to heaven. You know why? And I've had rich people say this to me. I don't need God. I have everything I want. What, what can God give me that I don't have? Then cancer happens. It's amazing when rich people start praying. Steve Jobs had all the money in the world. Stop him from dying. It, it's funny. It's it, rich people need to understand, and poor people need to understand that in life, all we have is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Right? That's it. That's why he says, when Jesus heard this, he told them, "Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do." I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So, who are we? We are a bunch of messed up, jacked up people who worship a holy and righteous God. Let me, let me give you a newsflash. Tomorrow is Monday. There's a lot of sin that's going to happen on Monday. And then you get to Friday, and somehow you get, you, you know, by Friday you're like, man, I got this sin so far. I got it all. I got this worked out. And then here we are on Sunday, realizing all the stuff that we messed up on. We go, all right. Fill me with your righteousness. Here's my job. Because we're sick, man. We're spiritually sick. The world is spiritually sick. Somebody says, man, well, I can't believe that, that all this stuff is going on in our country. Let me tell you something. That's what sick people do. Think about it. Right now, some of you, are, how many of you guys are fighting over the funk? Y'all know what the funk is. I'm not talking about sick. I'm talking about, about the time, the, all of the stuff happening, like, all the, the changes of temperature, and then one, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, <coughs> and then and then you live in a house with somebody who's got the funk, and they they give it to you. I'm not gonna name me names. That's why my son, like, he lives in a different part of the house. I didn't even see him. He's like, I don't want the funk. <laughs> Sick people, listen to me, sick people get other people sick. But when you know you're sick and you're tired of being sick, you'll take anything to fix it, right? Jesus says, I come to fix that. I come to fix it. There's a reaction. When, when Isaac called his son Jacob, there was a reaction from the son. Like he had to, He answered the call. He said, come here, let me talk to you. And he went. There's a reaction to the calling. You know what worship is? God calls you to worship him. But you have to do something. Right. You have to respond. This morning here, we could have stayed in bed. But for some of us, we're like, we, we got to come. There's a reaction. He's calling me to, there's something this morning he's going to give me. And I got to hear it. The son had a desire to please the father. Let me ask you a question, church. Do you desire to please the father? When a person gives their heart to Christ, listen, in their life of God, they're in, they instantly become a child of God. You have to know this. This is why our very first point was about our values. When we point people to Jesus because Jesus is the one who heals. He is the one that sets us free. Listen to this. This is what, this is what John says. First John 3 says it this way. It says, see how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children. And that is what we are. 
there's two types of people in this world. His children and not his children. And he says it this way. But the people who belong to this world, listen, don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. I, mean, I know we live in a world right now where it's like all roads go to Jesus. All roads, if you just hop on a road that says it's, it's God, then you can just get on that road wherever you're at and you can just follow him and you can just come and, and you, can just, you can just be a child of God. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except what? By me or through me. I had someone tell me one time, what about the people in India? What about them? What about if they're just a good Hindu? It's funny. A few years ago, I was in an airport in Dubai. And I think I shared the story, and I was walking to this airport, and it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and this dude was it's during Ramadan. I just came off a missions trip. I'm coming back from Asia, coming back to back home, and this dude is following me. So I go, okay, let's do something in America. Let's go to Starbucks. <laughs> so there's a Starbucks in Dubai, so in the airport. So we I go I go there and I'm drinking coffee and the guy approaches me. And I was like, what's up? <laughs> I was like, oh, I mean, I'm not packing, right? So uh, he's like, can I ask you a question? And I was like, sure. He goes, are you a Christian? I didn't know if that was a trick question or not, because I was like, you know, we're in the airport in a foreign country during Ramadan in a Muslim country. And I'm like, how do I answer this? And I said, yes. He goes, I thought so. He said, I've been following you. I'm going, you know this tattoo? <laughs> he goes, I'm following you. And he goes, and I see something different. There, I can see the Holy Spirit on you. And you know, when, he, when he used the term Holy Spirit, I'm like, okay, he's one, he's one of me. He's my and I was like, yeah. I was like, so what are you doing? He said, and the guy's Indian. He's from India. Uh, and he goes, I am actually came back from a discipleship uh program in India. And I said, really? He said, yeah. And he was telling me where he was from. And I was like, I don't know that area of, of India. He's like, well, let me just explain it to you like this. He said, we are, my, my family and my village and my city, we are the ones that killed the disciple Thomas when he brought the gospel to us. I was like, really? He said, yeah, we, we, we killed him. He brought Jesus to us and he was there for a little while and then we him. He said, but most of our town are Christian now because of what he what he brought. When Jesus says he went he goes to all the world, he literally means I go into all the world to preach. Yeah. And teach. Let me just tell you something about Jesus. Okay, I know it's hard to think about this in America, but let me just tell you this. Christ Jesus is not and Christianity is not an American thing. Amen. We were one of the last countries in the world to get the gospel. The gospel went to the Middle East, it went to India, it went to Asia, it went to Africa, it went all over the continent of Europe before it ever came to us. You know what I'm saying? When he says that he's the only way and he has gone into everywhere, he means that. Jesus is the only way. And you can debate, you can do whatever you want, but when Jesus says, think about it, when you line Jesus up with every, think about every other world religion. There is no grace. He's the only one that says, I will resurrect from the dead and I will come again. Amen. That's powerful, man. Amen. It says this, dear friends, we are already God's children, but yet, but it has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him. For we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. There's a response that the son had to the father when Isaac called Jacob. He, is, was, he, he, he honored his father by him receiving what his father was, was doing. That's what worship does. There's a blessing from the father to the son before any action was taken by the son. In other words, 
Isaac came, he blessed his son, and he sent him out. What did Jacob do? He just listened. Right? He just listened. Let me ask you this question. Why do you think that when you come to church that you have to get your life together before you can What, what are you going to do? Be responsible. Crazy about it. There's nothing that you have to get ordered in your life. He ordered it. You just have to be willing to come. You have to say, okay, I will bring this to you. I will bring my life to you. He says, give it to me. Matthew 7 says this, you parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people, that's you. <laughs> You're probably going, where, do I, where am I at in the story? You <laughs> sinful people. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? Amen. If the unsaved, if the, if the sinful, crazy people take care of their babies. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to come clean with this. So I, I, I follow down this YouTube rabbit hole at times and last night I found myself watching animal videos <laughs> out of all the animal videos I watched last night trying to fall asleep I'm gonna tell you this one that I just was blew me away so there's this cat <laughs> on a farm that had these kittens little baby little kittens right And there's this little duck, this little yellow duck, <coughs> that somehow on the farm lost their mama. Aww. And this kitten went over, picked up these baby ducks, and the people, the farmers thought, oh my God, that cat's going to eat these ducks. <laughs> but she goes and gets these three little ducks, brings them in, and puts them with her kittens, and begins to cuddle them. <laughs> I didn't cry, but I was just like, <laughs> I'm sorry for all the cats I've wanted to kill in my life, <laughs> but I wouldn't mind to have a baby duck. And so, and so, this little this cat man is like is 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 like loving on these ducks. And what they said was, what's amazing with these ducks, they have an imp they call it imprint. So then these baby ducks then are like, this cat's my mama. So the mama cat's walking around, the kittens are walking around, these ducks are like, what's up? I'm a cat. <laughs> See, so even they can be confused. All right, so uh, I, but I just thought, but that's like nature, right? Like that, that doesn't make sense. And so that's what Jesus is kind of saying. He's saying, don't you realize in the world there's like a natural love that goes on. Just think about the love that the Father gives to you. How much better are his gifts? How much deeper is his love? And you right now, you're carrying the burdens of all the stuff that you did. Let me tell you something. God doesn't care what you did when you were 16. you got to let that go. God doesn't care. Well, when I was 21 or when I was 36, even, hey, how about yesterday? <laughs> Build a bridge and get over it. Right. Move on. Amen. He's not holding that over your head. If you, oh, okay, so listen. So I want to stress this to you. So Jesus just says if you ask for something that you need, is God going to give you something you don't need? How can I go to God and ask him to bless my life or even to be with me or to give me this peace when, when man, I'm just a bad person? a father would he be? He doesn't love his children. Make sense what I'm saying? That's worship. Worship is that natural reaction that when you realize the depth of his love for you, what else are you going to do? What is Renewal Church? We have to be a messed up, jacked up church to understand the depth of his love. Righteous people do not get it. Healthy people do not get it. Right. That's a 
look at Adrian for something. I don't know if he's looking at you, brother. I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm preaching, going. He's gonna. He's gonna have a complex if he's looking at me. All right. So okay. So let me just end with this one. All right. So let me just tell you this real quick. And, and oh gosh. All right. This is the problem with me about I start studying something. Let me let me take you to something really really cool. Second Chronicles 20. Find that find that chapter. Second Chronicles 20. Uh, sorry, Matt, back there. I didn't give you this text, but let me just kind of set you up real quick. Second Chronicles 7. I've never preached this. I've never taught this. Maybe one day we'll revisit this. But there's this king named Jehoshaphat. What a great name, right? Is that like a rapper name? Yo, yo, Jehoshaphat's in the house. You know, I just was like, that's kind of like a cool rapper name. Anyway, so Jehoshaphat's his name. He's this king. But check this out. He's 35 years old when he becomes king. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I would be set with a 35-year-old being king. Right? I would want somebody to be just a little bit older, personally. All right? But he was 35 years old, and the Bible said he was a good king. He was a great king. I mean, when the Bible calls you a good king, you're a good king. He's 35 years old, and he's so... I don't say on fire for God, but he's so committed to God. I mean, he, he, he brings this entire nation of Israel, he brings them, basically, and it rallies them and says, we're going to start to worship God. We're not chasing these false idols anymore. We're going to worship God and make him the center of everything. And the Bible says that God's hand, his protection was around Jehoshaphat so tight. Now listen, for the first three years of his of, as, as king, no country would dare touch him. They wouldn't even put his finger on him. Matter of fact, they made him, hey, hey buddy, uh, can we be friends? I brought some goats. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's kind of cool, right? I mean, he's going after God. He's pursuing God. If he's going to be king, we're going we're gonna to worship the true God. We're going to call all of Israel back to him. Bam, boom, and God says, I... I'm so impressed with you that nobody's going to touch you. You're going to have the first three years will be peace. But let me ask you this question. What happens when God releases a little bit of that? Some of us experience that. We feel like there's years where, man, God is just with us. He's surrounded. But then we get these years that we say to ourselves, I thought you loved me, God. I thought you cared about me. And for some reason, in God's sovereignty, he, he, he says, okay, I've protected you like this. Now I'm going to loosen up a little bit, and I'm going to let the enemy attack you. Your marriage was, was good for three years, but we're hitting the fourth year. We're going to loosen up a little bit. Them smelly stocks are going to get on your nerves. Right? That's terrible, too. The first two years of that baby is great. I don't know what I don't know what it is, but when you have the baby is so cute, cuddly, it smells good. They turn two, horns grow, <laughs> eyes get green, head spins around. That's just they get possessed. I don't know what it is. Right? Look at this little baby. Like, ah! <laughs> what happens when God says to you, "Okay, I'm gonna I've been protecting." And now I'm going to release. So that's 17. Here's chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. After this, the armies of the Moabites, the Amorites, and some of the Neuites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. It's not just one army. We're going to have multiple armies. It's not just one kingdom. You, they banded together to come against you. What happens when God says, I'm going to let enemies come against you? Verse 3 says, Jehoshaphat was terrified. Can I say this to you as a Christian? It's okay to be scared. <laughs> Man, I just wish I had the faith like that. Jason is a coward. I am terrified. Do you ever get terrified? Sure you do. We all do. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, and he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. He 
you can respond. What happens when your life is going to really to just war? What do you do? He was terrified by the news and he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered every one of Judah to begin fasting. Verse 4, so the people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard. Did they just build a brand new courtyard? How can, how can enemies, I, God, I just built you a brand new courtyard in your house. We just did renovations. We just built this incredible thing on Athi Lane. Why, what do you mean the enemy's coming after us? Uh, you with me so far? Y'all see where we're going with this? Don't think for one second Satan's happy with us. Listen to me. Don't think for one second your life is going to be easy because it's not going to be easy. Don't think for one second because you're going to renew it. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now. If you go to renew it right now at this time, we're going to be attacked. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Amen. You can't have a testimony without a test, right? Here we go. Joseph and I stood before the community of Judah in Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard and the temple of the Lord. Listen, he prayed. This is what the, this is what the king's prayer was. Oh, God. Of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. He is the king. But he's going, there's one greater. He says, you are the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can stand against you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in the land when your people Israel arrived? Did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Do you not remember when Jacob was asleep and he saw the, the ladder going from one part to the other and you said to him, this land is his and I'm a descendant of him. This is my land that you gave me. You're not going to forget me. You're not going to forget the promise you made to me. So why is it that when you go to church or life comes in and stress happens, you get amnesia? Right. Yeah. We'll get this in a minute. Hold on. Here we go. He says this, you are powerful and mighty and nobody can stand against you. Verse 7, O oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in the land when your people of Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple in your honor, your name. They said, whenever we are faced with the calamity of such as war or plague or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple. What is renewal? We are a presence-driven church. Why? Because if God is not here, we have no business being here. If God's not presence in your life, then don't call yourself a Christian. You have another God in your presence. Worship is about Him. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Listen, where your name is honored, we can cry out to you to save us. And you will hear us and what? Rescue us. And now, see the armies of Ammon and Moab and, and Mount Seir are doing. Because you would not let our ancestors invade these nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us? For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. So can God, don't you remember the promises you made? Don't you remember what you did? Don't you remember who you are in your life right now when you go through stresses and you go through a trial and you go to battle, you go to war? God's going to remind you of all the battle wins that he gave you. Right. Amen. Verse 13 says this, And all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and children. What does that mean? Daddies took their kids to church. Right. I'm going to make a statement. Don't get mad at me. You can take it to the ball field. You can take it to dance class. Right. Yeah. You can take it to Disney World. Daddies take their children to church. Church. Amen. 
because the kids need to understand when the battle comes and war is raging, the safest place, the best place to go is before the presence of the Lord. Amen. And all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives and their children. The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaz, or Jaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benai, and the son of Jehiel. So I have no idea who all these people are, but that's, that's, that's evidently his, his, his. He must have done like the 23 and me and figured out who his ancestors were. All right? But he was a Levite. The whole point was the fact that he was a Levite. He was a priest. And he said, listen, all you people of Judah. In Jerusalem, verse 15, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. So here's, they're all standing, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're with their families, and they're praying to God, God save us. They just heard their king, God save us, God save us. And this dude gets up and says, let me tell you what God says. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by his mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God. Sometimes when you're in the middle of the battle, you have to understand it ain't about you. It's about him. It's about him working his power through your life so you can see who he is. He says, don't, don't stress, man. Don't all this the people that are surrounding us. Are you serious? Who cares? God's about to do something big. If you go through nothing, no stress in your life, how are you going to see the power of God come down? This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is yours. Listen, tomorrow march out against them, and you will find them coming up through, through the ascent of Ziz, at the end of the valley that opens up into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. You're going to march. Kind of makes you think now. Wow. So the daddies are at church because they're about they're about ready to go to war. They're holding babies; they might not see it yet. And the preacher man says, "Uh oh, something big's about to happen." Amen. He says, "Take your positions and stand and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you." Now listen, verse 18. Watch this. Do not miss this. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground. What's that picture of? Mm -hmm. Say it. Worship. Worship. And the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same. So the king led the people to worship the Lord and bow before him. Listen. Then the Levites from the clans of, of Korath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with the very shout. Now you probably go on him, what is this? Okay, why is what is this? Let me tell you what, let me give you the picture. So you're in the courtroom of the temple, the brand new courtroom of God's house, right? The house of God. So they're here, so basically they come before the Lord, they open the service in prayer. Then all of a sudden, you got this that in the middle of prayer, somebody steps up, it's a Levite. The priest steps up and says, this is what the Lord says, gives the word. When the word is spoken, then the king says, let's worship God. Let's bow down. So he bows down. Everybody follows. But check this out. Then you've got this group of people somewhere. And they begin to stand. So the people are bowing down. These group of people over here, they're standing. And if you go back and look at these two groups of people, you realize King David actually took them and said, you are our musicians and our singers in the house of God. So what you have is you have the choir of Israel praising and singing to God while the people are bowed down before him in worship. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out in the wilderness of Tico, or Tekoa. On the way to Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me. You people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army. What? What? I'm sorry, did we just sing there's an army rising up? Yes. Yes. 
singing to the Lord and praising Him for His glory and His splendor. They ain't even had to make it to the battlefield yet. But they're like, we're going to cover this whole thing in praise. Amen. We're going to worship and praising Him for His holy splendor. And this is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. I bet you that's all they say. And I bet you nobody said this. Oh, man, is there another verse to this? <laughs> is this the only song they know? Uh, right now, yes, it is. You ever get that one worship song that hits you? And you play it over and over and over and over and over. Listen, when Shout the Lord came out back in the day, I popped that bad boy in my CD player. Y'all know what that is. Sorry, you know what CD player, CD player was around. Okay, so pop that in there. Man, I was sick. I was just like, shout to the Lord in my car. People thought I was having like conniption fits, seizures. And I was like, just praise it. I love that song. At the very moment they began to sing, stop. At the what? At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among them what? No. Oh, there's a, oh, there's a battle going on. Yes. But it ain't against you. Right, yes. He says the armies of Moab, they began, they turned on each other, right? And their allies, and listen, and killed every one of them. And they had destroyed the army of Seir and began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, they saw there were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see, and not a single one of the army had escaped. Let me tell you something what happened. Things stress out in your life, and things go crazy, and life is hectic, and you feel like there's a battle at every corner all around you. Armies are shining. Here's what you do. You sing. You sing. You get together with your people and you say, grab the babies, grab the mama, grab all the kids. Let's stand in the presence of God and let's just, let's lift it up to him and let him do this. And let somebody say something in the name of the Lord. So the, 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 the preacher gets up and preaches this crazy message. And all of a sudden you got these singers that stand up and sing. Everybody bows down and march and everybody's dead. Right. Amen. <laughs> Can I tell you something? You're going to go through a battle, and you're going to go right. through a fight, but I'm going to tell you right now, you don't have to fight it. Amen. All you got to do is worship. Because remember I told you from the very beginning, Satan hates you. Right. Listen to me, church. I'm going to close with this. Just listen to this. If you woke up, good morning, how are you, hallelujah, it's a Super Bowl day, I care who wins, I'm here for the food and the commercials. <laughs> When your life is a war zone, and y'all know what that is. When your life is a war zone, here's what I want you to do. I want you not to be on the, do not take a step in that battlefield until you step in his presence and you worship him. Amen. Because what happens really on the battlefield is determined how you worship him. That's the first time ever preached, taught, and Jehovah's Child. Mm. That's crazy, right? Mm. You might have, you might get a little teary. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Where are you at today? What's your battle? Is it your health? Is it your family? Is it your marriage? 